just before we start today's podcast for inquiry, I want to tell you about the second annual BahaCon, the Blue Water Atheist, Humanist, and Agnostics Conference, taking place August 25th to 27th, 2023 in Sarnia, Ontario. You can find out all about the fabulous roster of speakers and other things at this conference at BahaCon.com. I hope to see you there. On today's podcast for Inquiry, I speak with Roy Speckhardt. Roy is president of the Humanist Foundation Endowment Fund and past executive director of the American Humanist Association. He's also an author, and his latest book is Justice-Centered Humanism. Roy and I speak on a number of topics, including his personal journey to humanism, how to get humanists involved in activism, how humanism leads to social justice, environmentalism, sentientism, and secularism. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Roy Speckhart. Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Center for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers, we have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. So Roy Speckhart, thank you for speaking with me today on Podcast for Inquiry. We're going to talk today primarily about your book, uh, Justice-Centered Humanism. Um, I've read it, I enjoyed it, and so thank you for for writing it. And uh, I I, want to start with uh, kind of something that's implied by the title. Uh, And it's a question that I've I've come across with a couple of other folks that I've uh, spoken with on the podcast. And, And before I started this podcast, I had considered humanism to be a worldview, a philosophy, a, a way of looking and understanding the universe, and then from that deriving a set of ethics and morals from which, to, to, to to understand priorities and uh, right. uh, and and how and how to weigh things on, on to make decisions, but. In your book, uh, and, and strongly implied from the title itself, justice-centered humanism, you seem to think that there's more that that, that being a, a a full humanist uh, is more than that, and that it requires a, a strong element of activism. And in fact, a lot of your your book is is focused on on being an activist and on not just looking at the world, mm-hmm. but uh, but changing it uh, right. so that so that society at large. Uh, uh, adheres closer to humanist principles and ideals. And I don't find that objectionable, but I do find that an addition to to, to, to humanism yeah. itself. And I, I, I just thought, have you thought about that? And was that, is that intentional? Well, I think that humanism, because of what humanism says about the world and about who we are in that world, that it draws us toward that activism. It draws us toward certain conclusions. Um, Not that we have to be dogmatic about that and have to say that folks have to, you know, take this position or that position very specifically. But there is um, a sense that we are here on this planet, um, yet that we are um, basing our ideas on science and our knowledge comes from science or epistemology, you might say. Um, But, and you combine that with the egalitarian nature that is inherent in being a humanist and seeing the world as populated by one people um, and the compassion and empathy that flows in humanism. And that, that really does call on someone to do more than just believe a certain way or think a certain way. I think it's, it's so that, so it is more than that. And I think that that's uh, a natural consequence of being a humanist and spending time with that humanism and seeing it evolve and as a person and as a movement. So let's talk about you. What, uh, how did you come to be a humanist? Is that something that you grew up and just looked around the world and said, this is a philosophy that uh, you, like, did you discover it uh, yourself kind of independently? Did you, 
did you find the uh, uh, the philosophy to be one of many, and then and then you found that it resonated with you, uh, because it's really come to shape a large part of uh, uh, not just your personal life in terms of, of worldview, but also your professional life and and what you've sure. done uh, over the last several years. So I'm curious to know your your journey to humanism and how you came to adopt it as the philosophy that uh, uh, that you hold dear. Well, I was raised Catholic, actually, but it was in upstate New York, not far from New York City, um, where Catholicism isn't extraordinarily strict. Uh, so it wasn't the kind of Catholicism that folks get um, where I'm right now in Norfolk, Virginia, or other places, parts of the country, or outside in around the world. Not the kind of uh, not the kind that you see from the Supreme Court justices, for instance. Um, but so the, you're what they would deride as a cafeteria Catholic. Yeah, oh, exactly. I mean, we, we went to church on Sundays and um, and that was it. There was not discussion about religion outside of that. And um, we tr- and, and my family in, in took it even less seriously, and you might say, in that we um, left church during the time when they passed out communion so that we could get out of the parking lot into the bakery faster. <laughs> so, so, you know, it wasn't... I- Priorities, because <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, the bakery's lines would get long, and so that was part of what we did. But the um, but so so leaving Catholicism wasn't too big a shift for me. I know I just saw a little over time that my views were different from Catholic views, and I figured I'm not Catholic. And then uh, when I was in college and I studied philosophy a little bit, I started realizing, well, you know, I my views are more and more divergent, and I don't really even believe in all of this supernatural stuff and happened upon a, um, one of my classmates who said, yeah, of course, you know, I'm an atheist. He's, and I'm like, gosh, an atheist. I've never met one of those, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, he, and, I, and I'm like, well, well, what do you think happens after you die? And, you know, I think I've stumped him now, you know? <laughs> and he's just like, oh, well, of course, I'm, my body's just going to rot in the grave. That's the end. When you die, you die. And I thought, well, that sounds rather grim, but you know, it sounds actually fairly likely. <laughs> and so, you know, I, just opening my mind to the possibility got me thinking and okay, drove yeah. me down the path to atheism. And I was pretty hard headed atheist for a long time. And I still call myself an atheist, but, um, but I was more anti religious at the time, thinking, oh, gosh, this world has given me a bunch of bunk and I got to, um, throw it back in their face, you know, <laughs> and, um, but I, um, but humanism seemed a lot more mild and I didn't know about it. I started to create my own thing. I called it progressivism, um, in the mid nineties. And, um, and then I just kept in my research for progressivism, this new thing I was thinking of, I kept coming across humanists. I was like, wow, what are these weirdos doing? Worshiping humans. That's a strange kind of religion. <laughs> and, um, until I got the you know, Coralis Lamont's book and a couple of others and I read them and I realized, gosh, I'm a humanist and gosh, there are other people out there that are too. And I can stop this progressivism stuff and do something different. <laughs> yeah. So there's, that's a, that's a fairly short long answer to your question, <laughs> how I came to it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you, you went from there and then you, uh, you kind of rose through the ranks of the American Humanist Association. In fact, you're a, you're a past president. Well, I'm the past executive director, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, sorry. So past yeah, executive, executive director for about 15 years. Uh, these days I'm president of the American Humanist Association's endowment fund. Okay. So I still keep my fingers involved a little bit, you know. <laughs> right. Okay. So I, um, I, I want to talk about uh, the American Humanist Association and its goals, because from what I understand about it, it's uh, very similar to the organization that I volunteer for, which is the uh-huh. Center for Inquiry Canada. And there's, there's Humanist Canada as well, and there's the Center for Inquiry based in the uh, in, in the United States. Uh-huh. And I, I want to ask you a question about, uh, about your outreach efforts, because uh-huh. uh, I would like more people to become members and to, to support the Center for Inquiry Canada. And uh, in my social circle, pretty much, uh, I would say, 
somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of the people I consider my friends when I describe uh, the Center for Inquiry Canada and its goals, which are very similar, I imagine, to the goals and principles that are that uh, are for the AHA. You know, we we perform. We support secular values, uh, reason, knowledge, uh, compassion, and they're hundred percent in favor and and support that. Nothing nothing against it, uh, and but they but to them or to, to most people, this is just so obvious right. that okay, fine. But Leslie, why do you spend all of your time? <laughs> which is an exaggeration, but so much okay. of your time, right? Uh, with an organization that is shouting from the rooftops that water is wet. Like, of course you're right. I, I'm not arguing with you, but like water is wet. Yes, it's obvious. And getting people to actually join, getting them to understand the work that we do, why it's important and their contra- how their contributions can genuinely make a difference. I have struggled to make, yeah. to make that connection. It's not a matter of understanding. It's not a matter of uh, disagreement with the, with, of of what we do and what we're trying to do and, and change, but getting them to uh, to embrace and and and, uh, uh, and and to take part in in right. some way oh, has no. been a and I'm wondering how I mean you you did a lot of that sort of work with the AHA and I'm wondering uh, what 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 you did to to get people to understand the importance of AHA and and the work that it does. I'm happy to talk about some of those pieces. I think kind of a preamble to that, though, is um, re- recognizing that in in the U.S., um, humanism is very still quite not very well known, and to the degree it's known, not a lot of folks participate. I mean, if you think about the entire humanist movement, and I you know say that broadly, American atheists and um, Center for Inquiry in the U.S. and uh, American Humanist Association, American Ethical Union. I mean, you combine all their supporters very generously in their social media and everything. You're talking about a million people, maybe, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's being generous. And a million people is just a drop in the bucket of the number of hum- people who are uh, humanists by definition in the in the United States. Out of the 350 million people in the country, there are, um, you know, something between 20, you could break the numbers down a lot of different ways, but, you know, 20 to 30 percent are um, in this camp and maybe of them that really kind of follow a more humanistic philosophy. It's still a majority of that group. So it's millions and millions of people. Why aren't so many folks involved? And I think it, to some degree, it's like what you said, you know, they feel, oh, well, this is what I've come to believe. Of course, it's true. But why would I do anything further about it? You know, I, they have their own many activist issues or not activists, but, but personally interested in politics or other things. And that keeps them busy. They don't feel the need to be involved as a humanist specifically. Right. Um, but I think to reflect on like how humanism, the modern humanism came to be, um, helps me kind of see, connect those dots a little bit because in the early part of the 20th century, um, you know, leaders from the Unitarian movement, from uh, a lot of Jewish leaders, uh, a number of folks from uh, other types of uh, persuasions came to the conclusion that the supernatural parts in the Bible weren't true, that they didn't really believe this anymore, that this isn't a revealed truth. So what do we do now? You know, and these were folks who were in the philosophy business, in the religion business, and figuring out what do we do next? And so coming up with humanist principles and the humanist manifesto in the 30s and so forth. I think that was what led this evolution of the philosophy. And I think today it's evolved to the point where the next step is really making a difference, you know, acting on our humanism. And that's kind of ties right into the book that I'm here to chat about. (laughs) Justice and humanism. No, I didn't answer your question at all yet. <laughs> okay, no, no. so you, 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 you've given me a preamble, and that's fine. Uh, yeah. and I'd, I'd like to know how you, uh, how you get people to make right. that leap from, okay, humanism as a philosophy, as, as right. a worldview, to, uh, I mean, I, I'm not expecting... Right. Uh, I'm not expecting most humanists to be like you uh, and, no. and, and leading an organization or, or, or like me, volunteering for uh, CFIC, sure. CFIC as I have for the last decade or so. But uh, 
but to you know to become members to participate right. in conversations to perhaps be a volunteer on an occasional basis to yeah. to make modest financial contributions <laughs> getting you know getting involved in supporting supporting right. the efforts in a in a in a tangible way rather than it's sort of in an abstract yes i think what you're doing is good and noble right and and i think part of that is kind of showing what could be done in a positive way and what can be done to stop the negative around us. And those that's kind of a very simple way of putting it. But um, when I started at the American Humanist Association, we had a few thousand members. We, the movement as a whole was very small, um, much, much smaller than it is now. And, um, and I think one of the things that started changing that was the recognition that we need to be a, a little bit more bold about what we do. So I was doing lobbying and I was one of the first staff members to do any lobbying in Congress. And in the very earliest days when I was not in charge of the decision making, I would not mention that humanism was a non-theistic uh, way of looking at life because I didn't want to offend the religious folks I was lobbying with and things like that. And that wasn't a very great way to get the word out. Right. <laughs> and then, um, but also, um, the organization was hesitant to be very vocal about same-sex marriage and adoption and things like that. Um, and I said, no, no, we, we've got to get out there. And, the, and as soon as I had the ability to make some of those decisions, we became a lot more politically active. We we're doing a lot of lobbying. We we're doing a lot of uh, political engagement of different kinds, um, trying to just be uh, um, a place where people can realize their values and act upon them. Um, and from the beginning, that was important to me. It's more so now, but, but it was even part of that in the earlier days. And I think that that is what dropped true people in. So we had an organization that suddenly was growing by double, you know, a few years in a row, you know, we were, we were growing very rapidly. And I think a lot of it was that people recognized that this was a way they could act on their values in a, an effective way. You know, we were going to actually do something, <laughs> not just chat. And people do want to chat, and there's nothing wrong with that, and educate themselves. And for, I mean, that's part of humanism, too, to kind of be mm -hmm. flourishing and, um, and, and to expand our own minds and thinking. Very important, of course. But, but that's just one prong, uh, one leg of a stool, you know, uh, educating yourself, um, Another prong is doing something for others, and then another prong might be making the world a better place in, as, a, as a whole. And so kind of putting that whole chair together, I think, and showing that to folks did bring people in. Okay. Well, uh, we are, uh, we're in the midst of our uh, summer fundraising campaign, and I'm, uh, maybe we can implement some of these, uh, some of these suggestions <laughs> yeah. in our communications, because we do do all of these things at the Center sure. for Inquiry. Of course. Uh, right? yeah. uh, we might be able to uh, uh, to get the message out in a clearer way, perhaps. So, yeah, so, I I, I think there was a sweet time when sweet spot time when the um, when atheist and humanist organizations were able to do public ads that were extraordinarily effective because we only had to spend money putting up one ad, and then the news thought it was such a big deal they ran it on all their channels and, and wrote <laughs> stories about it and things like that, and so. The uh, you know we'd spend twenty or thirty thousand dollars on an ad campaign that ended up having millions of dollars of impact, and I think that was a, a lucky time that is past, unfortunately. <laughs> um, well, you, you're no longer you're no longer so fringe that exactly. uh, say, uh, we had a uh, an ad campaign um, several years ago, like a decade uh, or so, that said right. there's there's probably no God. So just relax and enjoy your life. Uh, yeah. and, oh, I love that one. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, we, and, and we had it was a similar. We had a similar experience. We we, yeah. we put it out on like two, I think three or four buses in two different cities. But the yeah. the coverage that we got and uh, sometimes uh, 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 quite supportive and sometimes outraged that. Uh, that 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 this blasphemous message could be on on city city right. buses was uh, it was it was a successful campaign and it, it wasn't uh, advocating for anything than right. having people enjoy their life. Well, the negative side is is also a great driver of activity and involvement. Um, I hate to say it, but it's true. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world today that is scary and anti-humanist and. Um, 
goodness, we have to do something about it. And we have to stand up against those negative things. And I think calling that out and not being afraid to call it out is important. Well, that that kind of leads into uh, into your book on, on justice-centered sure. humanism. So I am... Um, I've read it, and uh, rather than summarize it myself, I'd like you to, uh, uh, you know, to, t- to to talk about it. Yeah. And uh, what what made you, you know, what is the book about, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 what what impelled you to write it? Uh, well, the book is about two things really, uh, although they flow together. One is kind of arguing for public policy as a means to an end. Uh, If we want to make a difference in this world, in the world that we face today, you know, bloody revolution is not necessarily the best strategy. (laughs) Uh, You know, um, trying to um, just hope for that it will get better on its own isn't going to work very well. We've got to engage in things that will make a difference. And even though public policy has got all kinds of flaws, and I talk about the flaws, um, that there is a chance for gradual change there that can make a difference. And that if we, we work at it, um, you know, our, the future generations will have a better situation than what we are facing. And I think that's something that right now is a little lost on some folks. I, I know that there are people who very validly say, we can't wait for the change to happen. There's, you know, people are dying, people are struggling. Um, there's injustices that are just so uh, absurd that we can't wait. But unfortunately, the alternatives aren't really that great. So either, either we work at it and the future generations have a chance of a better life, or uh, we try things that won't work and then the future generations are going to face the same problems we're facing today. (laughs) That's kind of the way I see it. And I've kind of, kind of lay that out in a little nicer way uh, in the book, but kind of explaining how that is one way that we can get things done. And then I talk about, well, how does a humanist come up with what it is we want to change and how do we decide as a humanist using our philosophy? uh, What are the issues that are most important? And, and, and actually that's, that's, Great, because you anticipated uh, wow. where I wanted to go. Because okay. uh, uh, you know, members of the Center for Inquiry Canada, I think it's fair to say that there's no diehard uh, believers in any kind of deity among our our, mem- our membership. Sure. So we we we, we share that. We, uh, we but uh, there's quite a political range, uh, a range of political views within uh-huh. the Center for Inquiry. I uh-huh. I think that it's. Uh, safe to say that the, I haven't really, un- dis- I haven't found any like homophobia. So I, being against equal marriage and such, uh-huh. but but there's range everything from libertarianism to uh-huh. strong socialism, uh-huh. and uh, w- within the organization. And so with a and when you get a bunch of people who prize independent and critical thought, uh, you're going to get people a that like to argue, who are well informed, sure. and you come to. Different Conclusions and have yeah. reason for the conclusions that they've drawn. So, how do you, how do you, as an as an organization, um, or as as a humanist organization? I'm assuming there's a similar dynamic at play within uh, uh, AHA. Uh-huh. Uh, how do you come to political conclusions? How does humanism inform what political stands you want to take uh-huh. and to have the bulk of your organization uh, behind you when you do so? Right. Well, we did do some very scientific surveying of our members um, early on. We, we So a fellow, John Green, who his name is very generic, so he doesn't ring any bells for folks, but he's very active in the media during election time. He's like the foremost uh, person on religion and politics uh, when it comes to research. And he, I happen to know him, decided he would help me do the survey of AHA members, and he He's redone it multiple times over the years so that we get a real longitudinal study of how our um, how AHA members view um, different th- issues. So it's like a long 50, 60 question survey. Um, but one of the things that we learned was that because we thought that what you just said was something that definitely is what we thought at the same time. We thought we had, you know, maybe we, we would if we had to guesstimate based on our interactions with local members and the like, we would have thought. Maybe we have 20% that were libertarian. We have a bunch of independents. We've got some folks who are more socialist leaning. We've got all kinds of things. 
and what it what the survey found was what it wasn't is it wasn't like that. <laughs> there was maybe two percent that were libertarian. There was, um, you know, there wasn't there wasn't as much diversity among the political uh, the membership as it might seem. And I think that when I've talked to people in, uh, on a more depth of a level, um, I'm not finding that it's is is uh, variant as it seems from the surface. You're absolutely right. P- Humanists love to argue. We love to kind of p- pinpoint things and tear them apart and look at them in different ways and, and show our unique point of view. But that unique point of view is often a variation of some progressive liberal point of view. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it's not a, um, if they're libertarian leaning, they're not Ayn Rand objectivists who think that, you know, we ch- should just ignore people. You know, they're, 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 they lean libertarian. When they're um, socialists, they're not necessarily off the charts trying to um, to j- just totally scrap the economy and do things differently. You know, they lean that way. And so what I find is that um, there's a lot more unanim- unanimity within humanists than humanists realize. <laughs> and, okay. um, and I think that's a, one of the things to keep in mind. So you, you took this... Uh in-depth and, and now longitudinal study, uh, which is, which is uh, I'm sure, invaluable. How did you uh, translate that into the uh, very political stance? Because uh, in, in your book, you, 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 you take very strong stands yeah. on a number of issues. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so I'd like, to, I'd like to hear your process for how you came to, uh, like what, what conclusions you drew on social issues and political right. issues. Uh, based on your humanist values, and and how and, and how that uh, how that was informed by the, the the steps that you've just described. Well, I think that the bulk of the issues that I take strong stance on in the book are social justice issues. These are related to um, you know rights for uh, you know equal rights for women. You know, tend to find ways to deal with. Racism and you know a more anti-racist strategy toward dealing with policy, um, trying to deal with climate change and, and environmental issues and in, in a head-on sort of way. Uh, these are the sorts of issues that I mostly cover in the book, and I think those issues can very easily be t- teased out of um, the basic foundational blocks of humanism. I mean, we look at the, the manifestos and other documents that people use as sound, sort of foundational for humanism. I mean, we're not dogmatic, so we don't have one Bible we can go to or anything like that. But right. all of these have some commonalities. And I, I find that the commonalities involve, um, you know, empathy and compassion or in some kind of combination. Um, the, obviously, basing our ideas on science and reason. And then um, something... Usually, there's some egalitarian piece to it as well. Some sense that that um, you know, the humanists in France and the humanists in Nigeria and the humanists in Canada and the humanists in um, in, in the United States have a similar kind of way of looking at things, even if we have differences, uh, which we do. We don't want to erase those. But the um, but so that but that there is a, un- a unanimity, a uniting of us all, uh, a sense that there that we're all of equal worth and whether we're humanists or not even. Um, and I think that that is part of humanism. And when you take those building blocks, it's really hard to go outside of the conclusions that we should be um, striving for social justice, um, looking at uh, intersectionality issues. You know, this is, it's, it's just science, knowing that if you improve the rights of LGBTQ citizens and you improve the rights of uh, black and brown citizens, these things are, you know, a lot of the boats will rise together. Uh, and it's not, um, it's, there's not a lot of, um, I don't think there's a lot of people who would debate that, who, who take that viewpoint. Right. And, <laughs> and yeah, I, I see you, you've, you devote a chapter to, to, to racial justice, to LGBT uh-huh. uh, justice uh, uh-huh. and uh, uh, or LGBT equality. Mm-hmm. And you also talk about environmental policy, and right. and that's uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I want to focus a little bit more on there because I think that there's there's a little bit more subtlety and, and meat there. Okay. I think that you know when it, when it comes to, to racial justice and LGBT equality, like we're we're just going to agree with each other. I don't think that there's yeah. uh, 
there, I mean, yes, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, discrimination uh, and hate both from individuals and I mean, particularly huh. states uh, over right. the last couple of years uh, in terms of, of legislation against the, uh, the transgender community. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think I think we're we're just in full agreement. But uh, when it comes to environmental policy, there's always a ton of trade offs. I think sure. that uh, I think that our listeners will all agree that climate change is real, that right. uh, you know pollution and poisoning our, our our land and water and air is, is is bad. But there's not always a lot of agreement on what to do about that. You know, if we yeah. shut down all of the uh, oil uh, drilling and pipelines and uh, no more natural gas and any we have to be carbon neutral next year. Well, OK, that might be what we need to do, say some uh, in order to avert a climate catastrophe. But then the number of people that are going to starve to death because we're going to tank the economy and everyone will be or so many people will be out of the job. It'll make the Great Depression look like a prosperous time. And, uh, you know, there's there's a there's a real uh, complex, subtle yeah to happen here and uh you, you you devote an entire chapter to it uh, in, in your sure. book and i'd like you to uh to expand on on that uh for our listeners who uh who should all read the book but may not <laughs> that's fair uh you know i think that when you look at the serious climate change situation that we're facing i mean the humanist of the year this year um talked about this quite a bit he's the person who came up with the um hockey stick graph um, that very popularly spurred a lot of politicians and individuals around the world to try to realize that we are in a situation where we are about to um, go through a, a, a process that will not be reversible and that we will be endangering our whole planet and everyone on it and everything on it. Uh, and so something has to be done. And, and we're looking at that, um, the, the something that has to be done thing is just a few years. <laughs> you know, we're, we're within uh, seven years of, of having to um, have it done or we're in very difficult situation for the all of humanity. And I think just recognizing collapse, um, you know, even looking back at Jared Diamond's talks about collapse and culture yeah, and things like that. Uh, wrote how, a book title. Yes, exactly. Um, humans are very reticent to recognize that um, because it's hard to um, see it happen. It's so gradual. You know, that he, in fact, in, in that collapse book, he wrote about Easter Island and how the folks there were just chopping down trees as part of their cultural um, work and, and to, to make food and things like that. And they just kept chopping down trees and didn't think through, well, you know, at some point we're going to have chopped down all the trees and then we're toast. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> so that was the end. And so um, of Easter Island. But the um, um, and I think that that there, there's been a good communication from scientists around the world on what's happening in climate change and that we can't make that same kind of mistake as a society, as a world global society. And so we have to make changes now. And I think we are making changes already. There has been progress toward reaching the goal that we need to reach. And I think that it is very attainable. Uh, I think that a lot of doomsday kind of scenario folks think, oh, it's just hopeless. We're we're we're, we're gonna we're not gonna make the the required cut here. But we but it is very attainable, and we are on the right path to doing it. But we need to keep making those changes. We need to uh, double down and and not use as much fossil fuel and things like that. And and we'll get there. But um, but that's like a very global piece. There may be some more specific environmental aspects you'd like to chat about as well. Well, I mean, I, I, I wish I shared your optimism <laughs> uh, on, on that front. I think, I, I, I mean, I, I don't have a, I don't have a council of despair. If it is, if we're going to make, uh, if we're going to make the changes that we need to do, it's only going to be through concerted efforts. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm just looking, even if we just restrict our, our views to carbon dioxide, there was a big dip during the pandemic. But right. uh, uh, now that, uh, I mean, even according to the World Health Organization, the pandemic, right. global pandemic is over, although COVID is still with us. Sure. Our, our carbon emissions have are now once again at record levels and, yes. are, and, and are increasing. So I... I I, I sometimes do worry about our mm -hmm. about my children and and the world oh, that yeah. they will 
grew up with to say nothing of of their children, my grandchildren, uh, should should I have any, uh, and which me, which makes it all the more important, right? And right. and as a as exactly. a humanist, there's no celestial safety net. If, uh, exactly. And, and as <laughs> and as you said, right, like we we and by we I mean we humans, we people have despoiled our local environments to such an extent that we locally went extinct. Right. We, we we killed ourselves, uh-huh. uh, and and we can. There's nothing to stop us from doing that again, even right. on a global scale. Oh yeah, and and, and, and so it happen. It's I, I wouldn't. I, I don't want to sound like I'm as op, I don't want to give the wrong impression about how optimistic I am. I, I do think it's very much an uncertain thing, and whether we'll make it or not. Um, and um, I know that there's good progress in place. You know, California is making terrific progress. They're doing. If if the rest of uh, the United States was as good as California, we would be ahead of the game uh, where we need to be. But it's not, of course. And so, and then the rest of the world, of course, and there's China. It was so much emissions that they're going on there, and all sorts of problems. But I think, um, but uh, I would recommend checking out um, the Humanist of the Year speech. I'm sure it'll come out in the Humanist magazine at some point soon because um, he talks about how very attainable it is. Um, and how we can get there. We just ha- can't give up and we can't yeah. let the right say that it's not happening. <laughs> I agree. And, and, and uh, yeah, and, and I think it's, uh, I guess I just, I want it to have an even more uh, prominence than it does because I want very much for our species to not just survive, but thrive for you know, many, many thousands of generations to come. Right. Uh, I, I want to... Uh, uh, ask you about. Uh, I want to read a quotation from your oh, sure. uh, environmental uh, environmental policy or okay. chap. Uh, and it and it says um, a number of folks I've chatted with in recent years fit the humanist definition, but are wary of identifying with our philosophy by name, since they worry it implies a disregard for. Hum, for non-human animals, right, right, yes, and uh, and 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 so, I mean, the name the name humanism certainly seems to center humans. Sure. So, your opinion, uh, what is the standing of non-human animals in terms of like, do they have moral standing in your view, and how should we as humanists consider non-human animals? So, yes, uh, short answer, but a little more to that, of course. Uh, non-human animals do have uh, moral value, and we all know this instinctively. One of the things I talk about in the book, I guess, um, is how, you know, if we were to have a situation, you know, a moral dilemma, perhaps, where um, a kennel was burning down and you only had a brief amount of time to save anyone, would you set free a dozen dogs or save the the person who's the, managing the kennel. Most people would say the person managing the kennel, not the dozen dogs. But what if the calculation was different? You could save, you know, a, you know, a thousand animals versus one person. Like when does when does the calculation start to change? <laughs> you know, and uh, and I think that's something that um, people maybe haven't given a ton of thought to. But you know, we we would not trade one life for all of the chimpanzees on the planet. You know, there is a point where everyone would agree. Gosh, you know. That's not something we would do. Um, there is a point where we do value, everybody does, um, the life of animals and what it brings to the uh, world that we live in and the ecosystem itself. And um, and so I think that it's not easy to put a, a numerical value on those things, but it's there. And it's different for some animals than others. You know, we might feel differently about chimpanzees than we do about, um, you know, birds or something like that. <laughs> so I, I this reminds me I had a conversation a few months ago with Jamie Woodhouse and he's uh-huh. a opponent of sentientism. I see. And the the key the key uh idea of sentientism sentientism is that it's just like humanism in the sense uh-huh. that it's a rationalist worldview, right? It it, it prizes science and, and 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 logical thought and compassion. But whereas humanism, in in his view, centers or privileges humans, Uh sentientism 
just takes it one step further, broadens the circle of compassion to include all sentient uh, animal, oh, well, all sentience. And so for us right now, with our understanding, it's sentient animals, but it could include sentient uh, extraterrestrial life. It could include sentient, uh, yes, even sentient AIs, if, uh, if, the, if, if such things actually come to pass. Right. And I was wondering if you'd, if you'd heard of it and if you haven't, what yeah. your initial reaction to that is. I have, I have some skepticism of it. I, I, I get it in a way that you have to try. So what I just said, you know, you have different value for different types of animals, you know, and I think yeah. that maybe part of that is wired in that we feel that these animals are more like us, frankly, or that they have more capability of thought and understanding. Sentience is a, a weirdly defined word that, it, that isn't as scientific as it might be portrayed to be, in my opinion. <laughs> um, it's not a it's not a black and white kind of thing. And you know, plants, you know, that respond well if you talk to them every day and things like that. You know, are those sentient? You know, I mean, how how big is sentience? And I find that there's not enough um, agreement on that subject to make it a very sound basis for making decisions, from my point of view. Um, <laughs> but I but I do think that. Um, a lot, there are folks out there, as the quote that you drew from the book, you know, that feel that we maybe over-center humans in humanism. But, um, but on, on the years of reflection, I, 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 I just disagree. I think that um, it is sensible to center humans. However, we um, should not put zero value on animals, and we should definitely um, realize that animals have uh, gradations of understanding and, and, and ability to be um, treated with dignity and, and, and of that they have. Yeah. Right. And, and to minimize, to minimize both human and non-human suffering to the greatest extent possible. Right. Is that, right. is that, I mean, the, I mean that's sort of the consequentialist humanist viewpoint, you know, we want to mis minimize suffering kind of utilitarian. Um, for those philosophers out there, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean that is kind of the humanist viewpoint that we want to try to minimize that, and I think that, um, but it's it's there's there's a lot of aspects when you think about uh, animals because animals interact. It's there's an ecosystem there. If you if we we know what happens if we uh, mess up the bees or you know these things can yeah. have catastrophic effects on the rest of uh, the ecosystem and ourselves as well and I think realizing that interconnectedness of life is is part of the equation yeah I I, I would certainly agree with that uh, I, I I'm still mulling over it's been about uh, two and a half months since I had that conversation with with Jamie and I'm, I'm still mulling it over it was uh, it, it uh, the folks can can check it out. Uh, it's a previous episode of, of Center cool. of Podcast Inquiry uh, came out in about mid March or so. Uh, but it it, occur, it it seems to me that even um, a, an enlightened self interest, mm -hmm. if we want, if we genuinely want humans to continue to thrive, then of of necessity, we will want to take care of our environment. If we right. if we want our, our children, we want. Uh, we want things to be sustainable because if they're not sustainable, they will end when right. you know, some key resource runs out. And uh, if we don't want that, then we need to. Yeah. And, and I think that's in a manner on a societal level. Yeah. Uh, extra important for humanists, because for from a humanist perspective, you know, we do just get back, getting back to that beginning point. You know, when we're done, when when I'm dead, I'm done. You know, there's no more me after that. So the only way that humanists live on our only immortality is how we impact the world around us that we hope continues on. <laughs> and if we do right. something that causes it not to continue on, that's kind of, <laughs> then it really is the end. <laughs> right. Then there yeah, goes our, our immortality our, that we had any, any uh, uh, aspect of whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Our, our legacy is the world we bequeath to our collective descendants. Definitely. Right. Uh, so I, I want to then move on to the third section of your okay. book, which is, which is, uh, my hobby horse, which is uh, humanism and secular governance. So I'm, uh, in addition to the host of the podcast for Inquiry, I'm also uh, CFIC's secular chair. And uh -huh. the importance of of uh, not uh, of keeping theocracy 
as separate from our governmental systems as possible for, for, for maintaining government neutrality in matters right. of religion. I, I want government to neither support nor, nor suppress right. uh, religious expression. And sometimes people are uh, people within the humanist movement sometimes are, are really keen on that. We should just suppress religious expression. And no, no, we need to be neutral, just like free yeah. speech means that people get to say things you don't like. Right. Uh, Government neutrality, and you've got a you've got uh, you've got a few chapters on on uh, secular governance. So I'd like you to uh, uh, sort of expand on that. Maybe give a summary of the arguments for how humanism leads to secularism, or, or how 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 the one sort of implies yeah. the other, and the importance of secularism for uh, for humanists. Well, it's it's survival for us in some aspects. I mean, if we don't have a uh, secular government, then the downside would be that we have a religious government telling us how to believe, and and that really takes away our agency to be humanists as we are. Um, so that so that's sort of baked into being a humanist is that we have to want a center, secular government. Humanists that don't want a secular government, sort of like self hating or something. <laughs> but um, well, you could but also I, have an anti theistic government, like you could have an atheistic true, dictatorship. Absolutely. That yes. just said, you know, you shall be humanists or you shall be atheists, exactly. and, and and any religious expression yes, of course. Uh, is is punishable by law. And there's a couple right. countries where that's. Uh, oh yes, I, I know what you mean by that, and I think that that isn't a good strategy. What we find is that um, um, a better the world that we would want to live in is one where freedom of thought is is more universal than that. That you can't because constraining it. And saying one type of thinking is not okay, whereas another type of thinking is okay, that leads down the road of uh, over uh, really increasing the power of government to an, an extreme extent, in my opinion, um, and and dangerous extent. Um, so, I, so I think that's one of the reasons not to go down that road. But um, but I think when I think about some of the stuff I talk about on that subject in this book, I think one of the more controversial ones is one that. Um, was taught to me by my, a past American Humanist Association president, Mel Lipman, who was a, a constitutional lawyer of quite significant uh, impact. And he explained to me how, um, even though we want absolute neutrality, and he was all about uh, doing humanist work in interfaith circles even, he said, you know, we should never have religious exemptions for anything. And I thought, wow, that's a very radical viewpoint. And uh, even most humanists would say you should have religious exemptions to do some minor things that, you know, that are maybe not too consequential, wearing different headgear or what have you. Um, But he said, no, no, there shouldn't be any religious exemptions. And the reason he said it was, and it makes sense to me now, um, if you can come up with any rule, any law that you want to have a religious exemption for, either A, the law shouldn't be there, and I should be able to wear my um, my Miami Dolphins hat just as much as this person wears a yarmulke or something like that. Or you should be able to um, so that so either the rule doesn't need to exist is is the first right. option, or the um, there there should not be an exception for it, such as you know vaccination policies that that you know, there's a religious exemption for it opens the door to many people not vaccinating herd immunity going down, everyone suffering. This is not something we should create exemptions for. So there either is uh, there either a bad rule or uh, should not be an exemption. Yeah. Right. So like if, if you have a rule that, say, for example, motorcyclists need to wear a helmet for public right. safety reasons. Exactly. Uh, and you, you can't you, you, you need to wear a helmet or, or to wear a hard hat on a construction site. You can't say that my religious headgear it prevents me from doing so. You have to find a way to wear the helmet yes, uh, and still meet your religious obligations. But the wearing the helmet or wearing a hard hat takes, takes precedence over right. your, your sincerely held religious beliefs. Is right. that uh, no, no exactly. religious exemptions from generally exactly. applicable laws. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, I haven't come across a religious exemption that, that didn't meet one of those two criteria. So it, it either, so I haven't found one that should exist. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I think I would, uh, I would, I would agree with that. Like if, 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 if there was an exemption for someone that's religious, then, and it, and that's valid, then it, anyone can, then, then the law becomes optional. Right. Exactly. <laughs> or, 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 
or you create a two tier system where the mm-hmm. law applies to almost everybody, right? Except except if you happen to belong to this subgroup right. of, of whatever number, mm-hmm. then the law doesn't apply to you. And I right. can see what that's uh, that, that that goes against foundational principles of uh, of justice in terms exactly. of uh, uh, one law for all. Mm-hmm. It undermines the law itself. Uh, people start to think, oh, it, the law is isn't as important as it it should be. Um, yeah, no, it's problematic. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's one area that I think I, I talk about in the book that maybe you don't see too often. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Any, uh, anything else that you'd like to, to highlight from the book? Um, just that I think that, um, there is, you know, I, I did a lot of research for the book on the social justice aspects. And I think that there's a lot to be said for, um, everyone doing their own research, um, I, well, there's a phrase that has gotten uh, uh, gotten tarnished in the last few that's years. That's true. Although, the principle that uh, that is, uh, I think that is valid. We need to expand our thinking and not just assume that we have the information because we had it before. There's a lot of new information out there all the time uh, that is really radically changing. I just read the Dawn of Everything, for instance. I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but yes. Um, but it really has a new way of looking at how um, authoritarian structures have gotten in, in, you know, inculcated throughout the world today, but didn't have to have. And that right. it suggests yeah. David that there Graber's is a before he tragically passed. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, that's a, a fascinating, I think, discovery. And that's relatively new, new, um, new scholarship there. I mean, 10 years ago, people didn't know that. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really in- interesting how fast things are moving. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, I'm constantly wishing to learn. In fact, that was one of the uh, major motivations for a podcast for inquiry to, uh-huh. for me personally, is that yeah. uh, every two weeks I get to speak with someone and, and learn something new, uh, <laughs> which is, which is fantastic. I, I, Great. I, I, I love, uh, I love learning and I'm hoping that I can spread that love of learning something new uh, twice a month or so to uh, to all of our listeners. So, uh, what's next for you? You've uh, uh, you've written Justice Centered Humanism. Uh-huh. What's what's next on uh, on your agenda? How how are you going? What what, do you, what what's your next step in in making the world a, a a better place to reflect humanist principles? Well, these days I am working with vote riders trying to help to overcome the voter ID barriers, the efforts to suppress the vote that exists out there. Um, I don't know exactly how that's playing out um, north of the border, but I know in many states, 37 states in the United States, there are uh, barriers to vote if you don't have the exact ID that matches the registration and so forth and photo and government issued and they, some states won't allow student IDs, and there, it's it's a it's a mess, and millions of people are being disenfranchised because of it. So that's an issue that I'm working on because I feel that the folks that are being disenfranchised, uh, primarily young uh, people of color and uh, transgender and folks like that, are are skewing the political results because of the of how it's targeted this this is I remember reading a, a ruling that some of these voter ID laws were surgically targeted to groups that voted uh, yeah. for, for groups and 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 areas exactly. uh, that 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 didn't vote Republican like it was right. it, it was a uh, the the rhetoric was entirely about maintaining the integrity of elections and being fair and ensuring that there's no fraud which is really hard to argue against because these are all important things that we want exactly. to we, that we support, mm-hmm. but the way that the specific rules were were created, that they, yeah. they target, they, they were, uh, uh, yeah, surgical precision was the right. phrase used in the in, in the ruling that said this is a this was a partisan effort to suppress the votes of people not voting for yeah. uh, for the Republican Party. So if uh, right. if if we can just allow people, everyone that's entitled to vote, right. to vote, and, and and let them vote who, for whom they want to, I think that that's. Right. Uh, a small d democratic uh, principle right. that I would be very, I, I would find it hard to argue against that in, in, yeah. in any way. Sounds well, uh, I wish you the, the best of luck with that. Uh, 
goodness knows, 37 states. Goodness, you've got your work cut out for you. I wish you all the success. Thank you. Uh, uh, in the future that uh, to add to uh, your efforts of the past. So Roy Speckhart, thank you for taking the time. Uh, if, if you get the chance, uh, folks, you can read Justice Centered Humanism, his latest book. And uh, thank you for being with me today on Podcast for Inquiry. No, I really appreciate it. It was an enjoyable conversation. <laughs> All right. You have a great day. Thank you. You too. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and engage in the conversation. Comment, rate, and review. Email us at podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. The Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada. We are a national educational charity supporting reason, compassion, and secular values. To our supporters, thank you. If you have not yet contributed, please consider making a donation at centerforinquiry.ca slash donate or becoming a member at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. Your contribution supports our efforts to have rational and evidence-based decision-making everywhere. CFIC is on the web at centerforinquiry.ca. We are on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at CFI Canada. Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Lee Shields, Zach Dumont, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblood. See you next time.